Things that I don't, I don't see here. Yeah, so if I take them over, I don't see what I'm doing here. So I just like you know, smash the keyboard and get it back. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for getting up early after the party. I don't know if it was good or not. I wasn't there. So anyone that went to the party is here. Okay. Not much, not many. So well, that, that, that explains why, uh, we have the, the people that we have here. So yeah. So, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, our experience uh, with, uh, Hurricane Maria, uh, title is Disaster Strikes, a Hacker's Cookbook. So we'll be talking about uh, how we went from last year's DerbyCon back to Puerto Rico. And uh, with the help of the hacker community, we did uh, some uh, stuff. And how the people from Puerto Rico started doing, uh, you know, their own hacks to get things done and, and you know, try to fix and go back to normality. So uh, my name is Jose Quinones. And I am the director of a health sciences university. Uh, that's what pays the bill, right? And uh, I'm also head organizer of Security Visa Puerto Rico, founder of DEFCON Group 787 uh, in Puerto Rico, and also founder and president of OPSIS Consortia. That is a nonprofit that uh, was formed uh, to back up all the um, administrative and financial stuff for B sites and uh, the local meetups. And uh, also we do infosec uh, talks in schools and university to get more people into this, right? We want more hackers. And this awesome guy here, you probably know him, Carlos Perez. I am the research practice lead at Trusted Sec. I represent. I'm a Microsoft MVP. Uh, in addition to that, I'm one of the Security Weekly co-hosts. Uh, you can find most of my stuff in docoperator.com. Uh, I know some of you actually complain, hey, you haven't blocked since, uh, December, but you'll start seeing a bit more blocks from me. Uh, I know of my code, you can find it in GitHub. In addition to that, uh, I also work with Jose on B-Size, DEF DEFCON 787. Um, and we're also like in two different boards for nonprofit for projects also. So we're pretty active in the island uh, with the hacker community in addition to that. So, uh, disclaimer, uh, we may use some expressions that may offend some people. I'm sorry, but deal with it, right? Uh, the facts described here in this presentation may differ from what, you, what you've heard on the news. These are not alternative facts. Uh, this is our reality. We, this is what we live uh, firsthand, and actually we too we got off really easy. Okay, so there were people that really had a bad time. So how did it all start? How did it all started, right? <clears throat> uh, we were at, at Puerto Rico. We are watching the news. They are telling us uh, the hurricane is coming. We're thinking of canceling the flight, and both our wives tell us, "Honey, go." Everything will be okay. And we had to go, you know. We're strong women. We are weak men. <laughs> so, so <laughs> these are the facts. But, 
it's a trap, right? Uh, there's no way of, of uh, you know, taking the right uh, decision here. If, if if you go against them, you lose. And uh, we we heard them, and we, we lose. We lost uh, either way. So, but there were a lot of good things that came out of it. So, uh, actually, uh, during the class, Carlos, there, right there, uh, you almost don't see him, but he's probably shaking in the in the in that uh, picture. He was really stressed out. Uh, he was uh, doing the 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 class, and I was, uh, uh, you know. Uh, watching Facebook, calling people, receiving messages, and trying to see what was going on in Puerto Rico, and uh, uh, we had to take a couple of break from the class to, you know, to get get communications with the island. So, just a bigger background. While I was doing the class, I remember I told my students from the beginning, "Hey guys, there's this hurricane hitting the island. So if I get a call." I'm going to have to ask forgiveness. I'm going to have to go run to the back and take my call. Does anybody have a problem? Almost all students said, no problem at all. I'm like, okay, awesome. So I'm having my call. My wife, actually, I told her, hey, honey, we can cancel. She went like, you have 45 students that depend on you. You're going. I'm like, okay, honey, I'm going. Uh, and all of a sudden she calls and she's telling me, hey, and she's crying when she calls me. She's telling me, hey. The winds have ripped the garage doors from the neighbors in the front. The neighbors in the back have blow up their windows, and the winds are gutting their homes. So she's seeing stuff flying out, uh, covers, mattresses, all kinds of stuff. She's telling me that she's afraid, uh, but that she's with my parents there, that the walls are trembling. My house is made of reinforced cement with rebar, and the walls were trembling. That, that's how strong the winds were. And then, whoop, no more signal, no more communication for 24 hours. So I was giving my class all the time talking, and then I—I I don't hate to admit it, but I was crying some of the time when I was giving my class. We just go like this, look at the screen, and just wipe tears, and just keep doing my class because there's nothing I could do. So I just keep chugging on. Yeah, it was—it was, it was really hard. <clears throat> so uh, disaster strikes, right? Hurricane Maria made landfall over southern, uh, southeastern Puerto Rico as a category four, a hurricane with winds of 155 miles per hour. And actually they, uh, they reported, uh, gusts that got up to 200 miles an hour, uh, in the mountainous area, the center of the island, uh, because of the, uh, topography, uh, the wind was funneled through the mountains and picked up the the, the pace. So uh, although it went in as a category four, uh, it was actually a five a, a, at a couple of times. So it was kind of uh, scary, right, and and horrible. So I had a little clip here because I don't want to have uh, too much uh, about this. But watch watch the the winds uh, moving, the the change of directions. And watch the white the white car and the cars behind it, uh, how they will get uh, mangled by the winds. What you're seeing is what happens when the ice comes in. When you hit one wall, you get a small part of what you have in front of the wall. That's the right. So this is in Yabucoa, that's uh, one of the uh, southern parts of, of the island, a little bit to the left of the the eye of the storm. So uh, they got it really, really bad, and and everyone that was in that part of the of the hurricane got the worst. Uh, so actually, uh, it's described like like this. You know, people told me, I said, okay, this is it. Okay, Maria, and this is Puerto Rico. Nothing to do, just take it, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there's no options there, right? So the power went out. Uh, uh, you can see in the upper part of the image, uh, that's Puerto Rico, uh, before, uh, Maria, and, and down a month after, that's Puerto Rico after Maria, and, uh, that place that is, that is pointing out there, the Aguirre Power Station, that is the main uh, power source for uh, Puerto Rico, uh, power generation source. So the hurricane hit exactly 
uh, it was a, a really, really uh, uh, exact blow uh, to Puerto Rico. So it, it destroyed all the infrastructure uh, for the power and uh, uh, destroyed the communications, destroyed everything. So the, the houses uh, that were built with wood, most of them uh, just flew off and uh, only the concrete houses uh, stayed there so but uh you know the hacker community stepped up you know they they got uh, uh they got a wind of what what was going on right and uh we have here the security team the goons from uh, Derrycon and uh there's uh Josh uh Army Train, uh, Zero Chaos, uh, Mycroft, uh, these are the guys that started it all. Uh, I called them the QRF, right? They, they just, uh, took control of the situation, started moving. We didn't ask for anything. Uh, they just heard what was going on and they went to work to get, uh, people, uh, you know, try to help us in any way they could. So in this one, I went to Marpet and I went like, hey dude, I'm going back to the island. We got hit. It's bad. Do you have a Balfan radio that you can lend me? So when I, I get back home, there's no comms, zero comms. So I need something that I can use when I get back home to communicate back and forth between my house with family. I, we're moving around and they're like, don't worry, Carlos, come with me. We go into the goons and they actually found a radio for me and the go other goons heard and all of a sudden there were orders overnight for Amazon, them ordering big boxes of radios and, and then the next day we had stacks of boxes of radios pelican briefs solar uh, batteries solar panels and they were configuring all of the gear setting channels writing processes for us like this is the channels you're going to use for emergency this is the channel for uh, medical stuff this is the channel for police when you run there oh we're coordinating already with national guard for you guys so national guard is going to be on this channels for you and this was in less than 12 hours. So I'm really thankful to the goons and everything they did. These guys are, are awesome, okay? There's, yeah. And, uh, well, the tragedy, you know, gets worse, right? Trevor forget. We lost Trevor. And, uh, some people took it as a joke. Some people took it as an opportunity to just hang out. Uh, but there's one guy, uh, called, uh, Tony Kennedy. And, uh, he did a, uh, he used the whole Trevor theme and, and, and did a GoFundMe campaign and got $5,000, uh, to send to Puerto Rico to help. So, uh, Trevor's death was not in vain. Okay. Oh, and then things got, got real, it, they got real at the closing ceremony. Uh, then the closing ceremony, uh, they auctioned another black badge, uh, it was sold, I think, for, uh, six, uh, sixty five hundred dollars. I don't remember the exact amount, but, um, it was, uh, great hackers for charity, uh, Johnny Long, uh, stepped immediately uh to uh work with the funding and help us uh work with uh, everything various b sites other hacker cons there was a lot of people i tried to get them the but it's impossible to read but uh if you go to the hackers for charity uh website you will see all the great people that helped and got uh you know, their, their money and their, uh, uh, best wishes for the people in Puerto Rico. So, uh, I, I get emotional with this. Uh, you're awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, the first shipment, right? This is, uh, what they got. They got some radios. They got, uh, like, uh, Carlos said, uh, batteries, uh, solar panels, uh, uh, they were uh, they were meant uh, exactly to help us and our families, the, our direct families. But uh, as you're going to see a little bit further, uh, it finished helping a lot more people, and and uh, they definitely uh, the 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 um the way that Derbycon behaved, it had a, ra a lot of impact. 
of what went on in Puerto Rico afterward. Okay. So we're coming home, right? Uh, we had to sleep in the airport. Uh, we had to uh, stay overnight at Atlanta. Oh, we almost uh, had to drive down to Fort Lauderdale to get a connection flight, but we got lucky and we got a flight right there. Uh, it was an adventure, not a good one, right? Uh, but it was it was a, an experience I will never forget, right? So. so we were staying in Atlanta, and they then told us we had to cancel your flight. We need to make room for rescue personnel on it. And there was another flight, and they said, "Oh, now you have to stay until the other day." Uh, the other flight now is all already full with rescue personnel and medical personnel going down to the island. They had priority, so we were stuck there with several army people that were deployed uh, to Fort Benning, and now they were trying to get to their families back in the island. And Johnny said, "Hey, we have a cargo plane in Florida. If you guys can drive all the way to Florida, Hackers for Charity will get you on that cargo plane that is going there with supplies." So we were, okay, if Delta doesn't get us another flight, we're renting a car and driving down to Florida and getting in that cargo plane. So this is what we found, right? Actually, there was, it was, it was worse. This is just a, a, a sample of what was going on when we got there. And uh, we just wanted to let you see uh, what, you know, how the impact uh, of, of the hurricane, the winds, uh, the water, the flooding did uh, a lot of damage also. Uh, the force of the rivers that uh, over overflowed and uh, they wiped everything away, roads, houses. Uh, it was really uh, horrible right there. Uh, but, uh, you know, health arrived, right? Yeah. We got paper. So we can start, we, we can start like, you know, Getting get, getting everything dry and uh, because water is wet, right? But uh, don't worry, everything's fine. That's the attitude, right? Um, but no, really, help the right, right? Uh, I think that um, the military did an awesome job in Puerto Rico. If the military uh, wouldn't have been involved in the process, it it would have been worse. There was a lot of uh, protagonism going on by the local government, the federal government. Everyone, everyone wanted to be the hero, and there were there were a lot of roadblocks between them. And uh, the local government uh, blamed the federal government. The federal government blamed the local government. Uh, you saw all the tweets and all the bullshit going on on the media. And that was just posturing from both sides because they wanted to come across as the saviors, the heroes. And, uh, and although I have to definitely recognize the, the work of the people, you know, the FEMA employees and the, uh, local employees and everyone, uh, the problem as always are the politicians, right? They, they want all the credit. For everything that goes on, uh, that the people do, right? Yeah. If it wasn't for DOD, the amount of death would have been higher. Uh, DOD broke protocol; they were not supposed to preposition gear ahead of time. A Marine Corps Mew with their Navy element uh, was supposed to stay outside of the range of the hurricane, on sea, close to the island. Uh, they broke rules and they just prepositioned, they went like, well, they get hit, it's going to take us even longer due to the size of the hurricane just to travel in. So they coordinated, broke protocol, broke rules, and they just prepositioned Ospreys, Seahawks, uh, all kinds of gear, Army National Guard, they, they kind of commandeer some of the Coliseums in the island. They place all of their helicopters inside, close the lid on the Coliseum of the extra aircraft, secure hangars and everything, and as soon as the hurricane passed, engineers went in, powered that up, and in less than 12 hours they were delivering aid and doing air rescues in all of the flooded areas. So, DOD guys, you guys are my hero, you guys rock. Really, you guys rock. I really appreciate it.
So uh, there we go, you know, it keeps coming up, right? Uh, Hacker for Charity, uh, they, they sent another shipment. Uh, the, this was like uh, I, with a couple of hours of uh, uh, logistics. Um, Johnny called me, hey, uh, there's a shipment going down. This is the flight. This is the, the time. Uh, we need someone to get to go there and pick it up. Uh, so we got there. Uh, it was uh, almost like a movie, you know. We got to the airport, and uh, they sent. They, they, they when they uh, saw what when they knew wh what we were going to do there, they just open up the gates, uh, go through, go to the runway. Uh, yeah, the the helicopters, the Black Hawks taking off, uh, the big uh, C 130s uh, arriving. Uh, this whole chaos, and we're in our car, you know, like <laughs> driving around in the in the runway. Uh, it was fun and scary at the same time. Uh, we felt like like action heroes, right? Uh, like a uh, Tom Clancy, you know, something like that, really. Yeah. Things got really bad at a point, and I'll we'll talk about that. So that's that's not exactly a bad idea, right? It was a, a good idea. So. Uh, like a month later, we also have another another shipment arrive of solar panels, batteries, uh, all the uh, lighting uh, that we needed. And uh, this shipment in particular, I, I want to uh, tell a, a small story about it. Is that um, Johnny calls me? Uh, it was like I was at a meeting like at nine uh, nine in the uh, in, in the morning, and he calls me. Hey. We got a charter flight. We're going to uh, send the last shipment of equipment that we have. You have to go and get it. It's in Ponce. I'm in San Juan. So from San Juan to Ponce, at, uh, it's like two and a half hour drive, maybe three, depending on the traffic. So uh, I call up a friend and I tell him, hey, I, we have to go pick up a, a, a shipment and uh, uh, could you come with me? He has a, a Ford van. So let's uh we need the space right so i uh, get uh, my friend and we go we take the the road trip we got there the plane arrived late so the plane really got there like at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the at night uh so we we had to spend like a couple of hours in the in the airport in ponce and we started uh getting things of the uh, of the plane and uh, not all the shipment came in because when they were uh, loading the plane, they had to put, uh, you see the blue buckets right there uh, to the left? They took up uh, a lot of space, so they left behind the, the batteries, the lamps. And I don't know how the priority list worked in that point. So they preferred the buckets. Maybe somebody had to go really bad. And... Uh, <laughs> So we got the buckets, and uh, we only got solar panels. So those solar panels uh, were in my uh, living room for a couple of weeks until we got the rest of the shipment. But the funny thing is that it's like 9.30 or 10.30 at night. I'm, uh, they're refueling the flight. I'm talking to the pilot, and I ask, hey, it's, uh, so are you going back right now, or are you staying more time? No, no, I'm staying overnight. I'm, I'm flying to San Juan right now. Um, I live 10 minutes away from the airport. So, uh, it's funny, it's sad, because this is exactly what happened all the time during the emergency. Logistics were horrible. Um, I'm not blaming Johnny, never in my life, okay? He's bigger than me, you know, he's ripped, so no, it's not, it's not his fault. Uh, it's just that uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in, in this uh, excitement to get things done and move forward, uh, they never asked what was the flight plan. So they just heard Puerto Rico, okay, perfect, go. Uh, and uh, I never asked, right? So uh, this went on in every part of the government everywhere. 
Uh, people were just not communicating effectively. Logistics were horrible. Things that could get done uh, quick took hours, days, weeks. And uh, I think this is a be the, the best example of why things went sour in Puerto Rico uh, uh, from the government standpoint. The, the logistics, they, they kill it. I've heard a couple of million times how logistics can, you know, win or lose a war. And definitely we lost this one. And, uh, people paid, right? So I'm, I'm just have, I just have to again thank Hackers for Charity and all the people that gave their money from DerbyCon and other places and, uh, the hacker community because they really made a difference. They really made a difference. Uh, their money was well spent. I uh, went to families that needed the help. It went to, to a lot of people. Some of the equipment went to uh, local government and local communities, as you will see later. And it made a real, real difference. So that is our story, right? So I, I want to go into the, you know, cookbook part, right? How this equipment was used how people uh what uh how the creativity of the people uh made a difference and and their instinct to to survive and use their knowledge uh in their favor affected the the whole the whole thing so the big issues in Puerto Rico were power definitely we had no power power generation uh was dead communications also dead security after the first week things got nasty right Healthcare, a lot of people had, had trouble getting the, the, the healthcare they needed. Water and food. So we're, we're gonna be focusing on the first three because we, we really cannot, uh, I'm not a qualified healthcare provider, right? And, uh, actually, uh, water and food, uh, yeah, it's just that, uh, we were not prepared, so it was a thing of, uh, supplies. So we really couldn't do anything about it, right? So for power, right? Yeah. First thing is generators. Uh, gas, diesel, propane gas. Uh, that, that's, uh, the first question that people started, uh, uh, you know, asking themselves. They got, uh, generators, big gas generators, 5k, 10k, uh, gas generators, uh, 20k. And, uh, they find out, found out really, really fast that uh, that's not a good idea right they burn to fuel super fast people tried to live their lives as nothing happened like 24 7 power uh the gas bill and the <laughs> fuel bill went through the roofs uh the companies that sell uh, li uh liquefied gas and and diesel and all that they made millions of dollars uh, during Maria, because people were buying fuel like crazy, they they did not apply their uh, you know restrictions of, of how to use it. So after a couple of months, uh, the inverters came in. So people started buying inverters. Uh, I I think this is the best idea for a generator. Generator, if you want high power, you can use them in parallel. So even uh, they're not that expensive. You can get them for four hundred, five hundred dollars. So you can buy two. Uh, so if you need five k to run a home, you can do it. If you want to alternate the use of the of the generators, you can do it and let them, uh, you know, take a, a rest because maintenance is another problem. So you have to change the oil, change the filters, and everything is closed. So uh, you better have some supplies and manage everything well. So, uh, you know, like uh, resource management is key in everything. So a bit about the generators. At home, I have a 17K uh, generator. We were only running it every 12 hours. I was consuming around 400 pounds of liquefied gas per week. Um, I had a small baby. Uh, I had... Uh, special needs child plus my other daughter and we were going through all of that stuff and uh, one of the things I never thought of is I had two maintenance kits that should be enough I uh, know 
those generators were for, uh, I never came to me that those generators were not designed to run so long, uh, for months. So I was doing old oil changes once a week on them just to keep them running. And then, thankfully, I drove a couple of hours and found an actual working antenna where I could connect to the internet. A couple of hours later, I was able to do at least two Google searches because bandwidth was so constrained and find out what was the equivalent of a car filter that I could use uh, and car oil that I could use. And I simply was able to get to a Pet Boys and buy multiple gallons of it and boxes of all of those filters and then be able to fix that. So if you're running generators, more than likely there's going to be an equivalent of a car filter. So do keep that in mind. Do keep maintenance in mind for those. And also uh, plan ahead with your spouse that I, you, I know you like air conditioning, honey. I know it's in the 90s, but we got to ration this. It costs money and it puts wear and tear on the equipment. Also, uh, the noise, uh, nights in Puerto Rico, uh, it was like, a, it's a, an eternal hum. Like, like a song from hell. <laughs> so, noise is horrible, so try to, try to work that. You know, people started pimping their generators, putting mufflers and, and all that stuff trying to get yeah yeah we we have a, a a joke going on in puerto rico that you know that in the states they made uh like lawnmower races so probably in puerto rico we start doing generator racers or something like that because uh there's so many generators right now in puerto rico that it's uh, ridiculous and uh the fumes really important there was a lot of death because of the fumes people did not knew that uh, CO2 is bad for you, right? And they 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 wanted uh, they didn't. I don't know why, but some people just uh, run their generators inside the homes or in their garages with uh, everything closed or whatever. So they were deaf. Uh, this yes, entire family died because of the fumes of the generators. So it's really important to have this in mind. And uh, definitely make uh, a plan of how to use it when it's going to be used, their maintenance and everything. So it's not just go to Home Depot or, or Lowell or whatever and buy a generator and throw it in, a, in the closet. You have to be prepared to use it. And in my experience in Maria, 30 days. 30 days is the sweet spot. Uh, we were kind of prepared. And I have to go out for supplies the last, uh, like, by the end of October. And there were still lines. And, uh, you know, like, three-hour lines to get fuel, four-hour lines to get food. So, but the next week, if I have stocked up better, I just had I would have had uh, less trouble. So, 30 days for us. And I think for most cases, it's like the sweet spot. You know, be prepared for... 30 days but solar power is king there is no replacement uh, <laughs> there is no replacement replacement for for the sun we would die without it right but uh, our friends again from hackers for charity you know it will keep coming up <laughs> uh, they made these kids uh, with uh, help from gold zero the company that makes the camping stuff the camping gear um to get uh batteries solar panels uh radios rf radios uh, uh um, lamps uh usb lamps uh, all the kits uh for the use of a single person small family so various sizes and uh definitely solar power was king my wife my wife was uh Always taking care and taking time, uh, learning how the equipment works because it will work differently in every part of, uh, you know, the globe, uh, the, the inclination of the globe, the sun, the hours, uh, the season, all that, uh, affects. So you have to learn how your system works, 
how it will work and uh, what is the uh, best uh, case scenario and the worst case scenario for your equipment. So you will plan for it and you can manage. Again, resource management is key. Resource management, logistics, I think that th those two uh, items on the list are the most the most important. Yeah, and I know it's uh, when I when we were showing this presentation, some people I know somebody mentioned when one of the problems that we found out in the hacker community very quickly about when is that when a hurricane comes through and rips over eighty percent of all vegetation in the island, for some reason there's not even a breeze for weeks, ninety degree heat. Not a breeze, and they even tried to 3D print a couple of uh, wind generators, and we quickly find out that they don't generate that much. You actually need quite a large amount of them to generate what you can probably generate from one single solar panel. So we learned that very quickly. In fact, right now at home, I have 33 solar panels in my roof. Uh, they generate about uh, 7.9 kilowatts constantly during the midday and I have two Tesla power walls right now at home and even me doing rationing exercises that's not enough to keep the entire house 24 hours running uh, on batteries alone so do as Jose mentioned rationing is key and planning uh, so yeah and for for those of you that like the DIY of course there's a version for it right and uh that's a pretty common setup and uh but we you can be more creative and uh use uh recycled batteries uh i broke up a couple of uh old laptops that i had uh the power cells and uh the thing with the laptop batteries is if one battery dies the whole pack uh stop will stop working to to uh you know uh, protect itself from uh da damaging fire and everything so from that pack it, that was an eight pack of, of batteries just one was damaged so i got seven good uh 1860 60 18 650 uh lithium ion batteries 3.7 volts i think there were um 3300 milliamp hours so uh what you that is enough to charge your phone, charge uh, radios, small stuff, and uh, it will work great. And also uh, super capacitors, uh, they work also super great uh, because they stabilize the, the, the voltage and uh, during the day, uh, you don't consume the battery load. So it, it will get stored on the, on the capacitors and... Uh, it can be really helpful to have a hybrid system with capacitors and, and batteries, not just a lead battery. battery. Um, lead batteries, you know, you have to take a lot of care of them. They have to be sealed batteries, um, uh, gel, uh, uh, deep cycle batteries. If not, they will die really quickly, and you also can have an accident with them. Also, lighting was uh, really important, uh, you know, nights... Uh, you have to, uh, like I say, resource management. You don't need to turn on the generator for the first few hours of the night. Uh, you can work with uh, some lighting. Again, this is uh, uh, some uh, gear that uh, Hackers for Charity gave us. And uh, we paired it more or less that way. Some uh, lamps with a mini uh, the Chirpas 100, that's 100 watt, that will charge a couple of items. So it will give you uh, like six or eight hours of light. So if you don't want to turn on the generator until nine, ten o'clock at night, or even later, so you can have a full run of uh, power during the night. So you just turn on your generator, go to sleep, and it will die down at morning. You didn't have to get up to do anything. So that's part of the planning to know how to work that that schedule, right? Also, uh. We got a couple of uh, uh, setups for personal use, some shared neighborhood use, or if you were, uh, live in a, a neighborhood that has uh, good communication, uh, we did it in my neighborhood. We set up like a, a central 
charging station and everyone could go in and charge charge their stuff so uh during the day uh like i said solar the solar power there's no no way to beat that uh, if it's cloudy well that's a, a, a some problems there but if not it will keep generating all day with no problems right so other big problem was uh comes right uh comes were really bad uh red indicates 80 to 100% loss so uh we lost most of the towers and you know these are not small towers these are 100 to 100 feet towers so it's not just go buy some uh you know pipes and throw them stick them in the ground and put a a little cable to it you know it takes time to get this uh this system up and uh the guys from the ITDRC helped a lot in Puerto, Li in Puerto Rico they set up uh portable stations in some other in some places uh through the, throughout the island they also had to hack their way and get uh old equipment uh get a a, a phone and let me uh just uh quote uh my friend uh Derek Cones actually he was in Derrick Cones when it happened he went down to Puerto Rico and he's still in Puerto Rico so uh, um he said uh your vehicle may be hill may be the hill you get reception from and that's in the top of the car and uh your antenna mount may be one that has partially destroyed your rack may be a police barricade your uh BOP system uh for a crisis call center may be a Wi-Fi connected android phone to a VSAT so they also have to improvise and do a lot of crazy stuff and they did a great job so if you want to join uh they they help in every uh, major event in the states and uh they they are really really good people so um for communications we got uh some Baofeng radios and Louis Vuitton. uh they really uh the the charge holds up a lot it's like an old Nokia phone you charge them and they just go and uh and the UHF gives you a a, a good range uh, in real uh, world scenario like an urban urban setting you might get a mile or or so of uh of range and that's all that's really good for local coordination in, in doing uh, activities and all that but if not you can go like our friends from the puerto rico air national guard they uh created some uh repeaters homemade repeaters using some biofang radios the uv 5r they are really cheap, twenty-five dollars, thirty-five dollars each. So that whole setup is like a hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars, and you can have a BHF repeater up and running in 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 a while. We also have a, another friend, Javier Marave. He started uh, to work with uh, people from Gautena, and uh, he did the initiative called Reconnect Puerto Rico. So he went to Santurce, that is a really, uh, poor part of the metro area in Puerto Rico. And they set up in the roofs, uh, antennas, uh, attached to, uh, the antennas. As you can see, there's a plastic cup protecting the, the antenna from the weather. So you have to get creative in this, uh, type of environment. Also, uh, we have, uh, in Barranquitas, this is a, a place in the center of the island. They got almost, uh, 11 miles from, the system, this is a mesh network, right? Also, we have a Joel Martinez. He did, uh, a small, uh, web app to run on a Raspberry Pi using a captive portal and some DNS, uh, spoofing to, uh, so he could use the same domain name, uh, offline. And practically he went, uh, to, uh, like, uh, uh, town plazas. And, uh, he's, he stayed there a couple of, of hours, uh, turned on the Wi-Fi hotspot on the, and the Raspberry Pi. People connected. They just, uh, wrote a message, uh, put up a cell phone for the people that the message was, was intended to. So he used a stored and forward technique. Then he went out, connected to the internet, and all the messages, uh, went out. So he was helping out, uh, the communication. Yeah.
carrier pigeons. So we also have, you know, standard gear that, uh, you know, our good old friend, uh, the Wi-Fi pineapple, you use it to see what's going on in the air and how to set up your, your gear. Uh, old FM transmitter radios. You're not supposed to do it, right? The FCC won't let you, but, uh, it will definitely, uh, go, uh, a long way to keep people informed. Security. This is, uh, yeah, it, it went, it went, uh, walking dead style. It was really nasty. After a week of, uh, no resources, uh, the people started, you know, the, the poor people from, uh, the, the, the island, they didn't, they were not prepared. The supplies from the government weren't arriving. They were hungry. So they went out to get food. So people got out to do raids. And, uh, it was really, really bad. People got out with, you know, AK-47s. They got to a place, get, get out of a van and just, uh, go in, take whatever they wanted and leave. So hunger is a, you know, dangerous motivator, right? So get the locals organized. You know, we did uh, the neighborhood watch. So we did some random uh, 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 rounds uh, in our community. And uh, this is my community. So download your maps beforehand. So you don't have data, but you can use the maps, right? And this is Carlos' uh, community. And all our communities here, all these communities, were communities that were uh, affected in a positive way with, with the radios that Hackers for Charity gave us. So we started giving radios to other communities so they could uh, communicate, coordinate their activities, and, and do a great job. We also went to the mayor's office in the water reserves and the uh, temporary sock that they uh, had to manage the emergency. They were using runners from... Uh, Truck to truck, uh, they didn't have any way to communicate. Cell, phone, cell phones were down and nobody wants, uh, today nobody uses RF radios, old style, old style RF radios. So definitely, uh, this is a, a, a thing that came in handy and this helped a lot for the logistics of, of giving out the water to people. So some things good came out of this, right? We learned a lot, right? And we did have our B-sides, so definitely our, this is our fifth B-sides. We got a, uh, uh, we got a to do it in January 2018. And we drank a lot of Pitorro, that's, uh, Puerto Rican moonshine, the best. And, uh, we also did, uh, a disaster preparedness and response hackathon, right? And, uh, uh, some really good projects came out of it. Uh, the guy that you see in the, in the photo, he did a Gotenna equivalent system with, uh, using a LoRa, Wi-Fi LoRa, uh, uh, ship, a system on a sock. And he did it in, uh, using like 20 bucks. So, uh, Gotenna works really good, but it's, it's a product for camping and hiking, so it's 300, 200 something a pair, but, uh, you can do it with 25, 30 dollars and get the, exactly the same system to communicate, create a mesh network and communicate. Also, families and communities came together. You know, so I got my kids to play, uh, some, uh, dice games and, uh, I, I, I couldn't get them to, to do, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but at least I got them to do some dice games, right? And, uh, people started going out, the uh, kids rode their bikes, had a great time. So, uh, it was a, a, a community building event also. So in general, what we learned, uh, commu commu uh, effective communications will sa save lives. Radio, licensed radio operators will make a difference. Uh, VHF and UHF will work on an emergency for short range communications. HF will link up out outposts and forward bases. Satellite and data uplinks will work on most places. Uh, not everywhere, but they will work on most places. Uh, satellite phones uh, are not that expensive. Uh, there's like 500 or 700 dollars, and then you pay like 70 dollars a month. 
So some people cannot pay them, but they're accessible, right? Uh, experiment with mesh networks. Uh, you can do a lot of w with them. It's really uh, cheap. Power, solar power and batteries are a must. Fuel will be scarce. We didn't have a fuel deficiency in the island, but there were so many people going out to get them that the lines were horrible. There were, there were always few. Yeah, I had 12 hours and I, I did four only, but, uh, <laughs> I got a better uh, gas station than yours. So, uh, although the, the fuel was there, getting it was the problem, right? Uh, power management, really important. Social order will fall. In an extended time, extended time, uh, people will, will start fighting for resources. Uh, it's not the walking dead. It happens in the real life. Water treatment will save your life. We had some cases of, uh, leptospirosis. That's, uh, infection from rats, uh, urine. And, uh, bat logistics, uh, will kill everything, right? And government sucks, no matter which one is in power, right? So make, uh, to close down and make things real clear, 3,000, approximately 3,000 U.S. citizens died as a consequence or during Maria. This is truth. The Institute of Forensic Sciences could not handle the body count. They had to bring in containers to put up the bodies, the, the bodies in a refrigerated containers because there was no room for the people that they have to process. Still, there was a lot of death. And to make things even clearer, more than 120,000 Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans have served in the U.S. military since the World War I. Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. We paid in blood. So there should be no fucking doubt that we are U.S. citizens. Thank you.